Hello and welcome to the podcast for Ray Church of the Nazarene. I'm Ben Beckman, Senior Pastor, and I'm glad that you have tuned in to listen to our services and sermons. We've reopened our sanctuary and would love to have you join us in person at 410 Blake Street in Ray, Colorado for our Sunday morning worship services that begin at 1045, if you feel comfortable to do so. We would also invite you to join us live on Facebook, YouTube, or our website if that's a better fit for you at this time. Please visit our website at raynaz.com and our Facebook page for more information regarding our services. It is my prayer that you experience the presence of God during your time with us, whether in person or online. Again, thank you and welcome to our podcast. Today is week three of our Advent series with the theme focus on joy. This week we talk about what is joy. We understand that it's an attitude that God's people adopt, not because of happy circumstances, but because of their hope in God's love and promise. We also talk about how the joy of God's people is not determined by their struggles, but by their future destiny. We thank you so much for taking time to tune in and listen. God bless. Today is our third Sunday of Advent, and as... Uh, Chapman's lit our third candle of joy. Uh, that's what we are going to be focusing on today, is this theme of joy and what this means for us today. Everyone longs for a joy that, that lasts, and Jesus is really the source of that joy that we need. But we must be willing to come before him to receive it. And before we get too far down that path, I want to explore what it means, what biblical joy looks like. First, it's an attitude that God's people adopt, not because of happy circumstances, but because of their hope in God's love and His promise. When we look back to the Israelites and when they were suffering with slavery in Egypt, God raised up Moses to lead them to freedom, to, um, to, to point them in, in his ways, to restore that nation back to what God intended. And the very first thing the Israelites did as they were freed was they sang for joy. Even though they were in the middle of a desert, even though the, the places where they were at were unfamiliar and hard and difficult, the first thing they did was sing for joy. Now, as we follow their story, we know that that didn't last long. But at this moment, as we were looking at this point, the first thing they did was sing for joy. Even though things were were kind of bleak at that time, they were vulnerable. The promised land was still far away. They rejoiced anyway. Later, biblical poets looked back at this story and remembered how the Lord caused his people to leave with joy his chosen ones with shouts of joy, as we read in Psalm 105, verse 43. Now this joy in the wilderness, this was a defining moment. It was a way of saying that the joy of God's people is not determined by their struggles, but by their future destiny. This was a forward-looking process. And this is why it's significant that when, we, when Jesus of Nazareth was born, it was announced as good news of great joy, as we read in Luke chapter 2, verse 10. Jesus taught his followers the same joy in the wilderness. When the people reject and persecute you for following me, rejoice. Be very glad because your reward is great in heaven, as we read in Matthew chapter 5, verse 12. Now, after Jesus' death and resurrection, Jesus commissioned his followers to go out and announce the good news that he was a risen king of the world. And as they did, the early Christian communities were known for being full of joy, even though they were persecuted. And we see that in Acts chapter 13, verse 52. Then we can look at the life of Paul. When the Apostle Paul was sitting in a dirty Roman prison, he could say that he's chosen joy even if he gets executed. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 1, he calls this joy of faith 
or a joy in the Lord. And he believed it was God's spirit in Romans 15, verse 13, that it was a sign that Jesus' presence is with you, inspiring hope in the midst of hardship. And when you believe that Jesus' love has overcome death itself, joy becomes reasonable in the darkest of circumstances. Now, this doesn't mean that we suppress or ignore our sorrow. This isn't something that we uh, kind of put on a brave face. You know, I'm joyful. I'm a Christian. I'm supposed to be full of joy. And so choosing and having this heart and attitude of joy doesn't mean that we don't, that we aren't truthful about what we experience today. It's not healthy and it's not necessary. In fact, we see Paul often expressed his grief about missing his loved ones, uh, losing friends or even his own freedom. And he called this being full of sorrow, yet rejoicing. He writes about this in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 10. As he acknowledged his pain, he also made a choice to trust Jesus. That his loss wouldn't be God's final word. Now this is very different from, I would even say, the trite advice that we get today. To turn that frown upside down, have you heard that one? I hate that. Christian joy is a profound decision of faith and hope in the power of Jesus' own life and his love. It's this forward-looking perspective. It's understanding where we are today, but it's, it's anchoring it in something more, something beyond ourselves. It's looking forward. So as we look at, at this theme of joy today, we're looking and taking another look at the life of John the Baptist through this lens of joy. We're going to look at, at how his joy was based on his identity. He, understand, he understood who he was. We're going, going to look at how his joy was based on his unwavering obedience. And lastly, we'll look at how John's joy was on display. I want you to turn in your Bibles to John chapter 1, verses 19 through 34. John chapter 1, verses 19 through 34. Now this was John's testimony. When the news of Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was, he did not fail to confess, but confessed freely, I am not the Christ. They asked him, then who are you? Are you Elijah? He said, I'm not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. Finally, they said, who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? John replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am the voice of one calling in the desert. Make straight the way of the Lord. Now some Pharisees who had been sent questioned him, Why then do you baptize if you are not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? I baptize with water, John replied, but among you stands one you do not know. He is the one who comes after me, the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. This all happened at Bethany on the other side of the Jordan, where John was baptizing. Verse 29. Actually, that is not how far I want to go today. We're going to stop right there. Verse 28. My apologies. So a couple of things as we look at this text today. John, John was kind of unique, and we get pictures of him and descriptions of him. He was a wild man in the desert, and I think he's the kind of guy I would have listened to, you know? He, had, he seems to have that demeanor about him, and he was fully convinced of who he was, of what God was asking him to do, and making sure that the way was made straight for us to encounter God. So as we look at, at John's um, identity of who he was convinced 
he was. John understood who he was and who he was called to be. In verses 21 through 23, as we look at that, in the Pharisees' minds, there were four options regarding John the Baptist's identity. And here we see that in the text, and, and one of those is the prophet foretold by Moses, clear back in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15. There was even a question whether he was Elijah coming back. Malachi verse 4 and chapter 4 verse 5 talks about this expectation. The Pharisees were also expecting the Messiah. So, was he the Messiah? Or was he just a crazy man in the desert? Was he a false prophet? John denied being any of the first three. Instead, he called himself, in the words of the Old Testament prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. The leaders kept pressing John to say who he was because people were expecting this coming Messiah. So they were looking and asking and questioning, are you him? But John emphasized only why he had come. And that's a weird way to answer that question, isn't it? They were asking who he was, and his answer was why he came. He says he came to prepare the way for the Messiah. And the, and the Pharisees, they missed this. They wanted to know who John was. But John, his intent was to prepare them to recognize who Jesus was. We see here that John was far less concerned on who they thought he was, but was laser focused on who he was pointing to. We see here that John's joy was found in his future view of his role and identity in preparing for Jesus. He understood who he was in the light of what was happening around him. And if we read this text and we, we understand where we are at on this side of history, in many ways, we are called to be John the Baptist today. We're called to be the ones of the voice in the desert. We're called to be the ones to prepare the way, to point people to Jesus. And I find myself sometimes falling into this, and I wonder if maybe you do too. And sometimes it's not even a conscious thing that I'm doing this, but, but I get caught up in other parts of my identity and not necessarily pointing to who Jesus is. Because if, if I have this relationship and this connectedness with Jesus, I want Jesus to be seen in me. I want to be pointing people to Jesus. And I need to be less concerned who I am and more concerned with who Jesus is and pointing people to him. And John, man, he got that. He understood it. And it, was, it came out in the way that he talked about it. It came out in the way that he was obedient. It came out in, in this passage in just such significant ways. And I think sometimes we get lost in that. We miss it, just like the Pharisees did. So we see that John understood his identity, and there was joy in that. This wasn't something that weighed heavy on him. He wasn't miserable about this. He wasn't miserable in his identity. He was happy to tell people about Jesus. His joy also came out in the way that he was obedient to what God had called him to do. In verses 23 through 28, we see this in the way that he, he interacted in the conversation he had. We see in this passage that, that John was baptizing Jews. This was a very weird thing for him to be doing. The Essenes, who were a strict uh, monastic sect of Judaism, they practiced baptism 
for purification. They practiced it um, as a ritual, but mostly focused on Gentiles, non-Jews. I'm sorry, that's not correct. John was focusing on non-Jews. So normally non-Jews were baptized when they converted to Judaism. So what he was doing was baptizing Jews and Gentiles. And so this baptism of Jews was very unorthodox and was causing quite a stir. So when the Pharisees began questioning John's authority to do this, they were asking who gave John the right to treat God's chosen people like Gentiles. This was an insult for John to be treating God's chosen people this way. John addresses this and he says, I baptize with water. He was trying to get, he was trying to get them to see and help them pre- perform a symbolic act of repentance. But this was lost on the Pharisees. They were caught up in the ritual of what was happening. They were caught up in the offense of what John was giving them. They were offended and they misunderstood and they, they completely missed this. And John again points to the one who would come who truly forgives sins, something only the Messiah could do. And so John's joy, as we see here, was found in his obedience to God in the part he had for him to play. John's joy was in his obedience. John, as we read, as we read on, uh, faced intense persecution for what he's doing here. Intense pressure for obeying God in this way. And I can't help but look at my own life and wonder too if sometimes my joy in obedience is based on something different. Is my joy in obeying God, in fulfilling God's purpose outside of myself? Or is my joy based on another agenda? Do I have a selfish motivation for obeying God? God may ask me to do something, but I can take that and twist that and make it self-serving. I can make it something that, that distracts from God and points to myself. And we see here that John was unwavering in his obedience and his joy was based on, on fulfilling what God had asked him to do despite the persecution that he faced, despite how people were, were jumping on his case, despite what they were doing to him. He was laser fulfilling God's purpose for you and for him. Or do you have another agenda? We also see here that John's joy was based on something else too. John's joy was displayed in making Christ known, on making Christ famous. In verses 26 through 28, we see this begin to unfold. John the Baptist said he was not even worthy to be Christ's slave to perform the humble task of even unfastening his shoes. But if we look at Luke chapter 7, verse 28, Jesus says something significant about him. John 7, 28 says this, I tell you, among those born of women, there is no one greater than John, yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. Jesus said that John was the greatest of all prophets. If such a great person felt inadequate even to be Christ's slave, how much more should we lay aside our pride to serve Christ? When we truly understand who Christ is, our pride and our self-importance melt away. They become second, and he becomes first. The greatness of Christ is on display in our lives if we allow it. 
What John understood here was who he was. Again, based on his identity, he understood who he was in relation to who Christ is. And understanding that relationship un- unfolded so much in his work and ministry. Because he knew who Jesus was and who Jesus came to do, he understood his position. John's joy was based on the future of the Messiah coming to save mankind. His joy was found in Jesus being exalted. And as I'm asking you these questions, I'm asking myself these same questions. This isn't this. I'm asking myself these things too. What does our joy on display look like? Who or what is exalted in your life? We often lose our joy. What happens when you run out of joy? Life just isn't as good when you run out of joy. Maybe you're here this morning and you've lost some of your joy. Something's bothering you, something's troubling you, something's weighing heavy. You've got worry that just won't go away. You've been disappointed, you've been hurt, you've been grieved. Maybe today you're running on empty. You've lost your joy. So I wanna ask you today, maybe we need to shift our short-sighted view and understanding of joy to what scripture shows us is joy. Remember, it's an attitude that God's people adopt, not because of happy circumstances, but because of their hope in God's love and in his promise. Think about that for a minute. Think about that in the light of what's heavy in your life today. The disappointments the way that we look at our world today, the way we look at society, it robs us of our joy. But if we think back and remember that it's an attitude that we need to adopt, that means it's a choice. And it's not a fake emotion. It's a genuine choice in faith relying and sourced and anchored in God's promise and in his love. The joy of God's people is not determined by their struggles, but by their future destiny. I've got good news for you today. Today ain't it. It's not, this isn't all there is. There's a future that we need to be looking forward to. There's a future that we need to be anticipating. And that's at the very heart of Advent. It's at the heart of it. Today isn't it. And if today's it, no wonder you're not full of joy. No wonder you've lost your joy. I want to pray for you as the praise team makes their way up. And I don't know where this message finds you today. But it's my hope that maybe we need to realign our perspective of joy today. To understand once again where it's anchored. And to lose our short-sighted view of it and look to what scripture reveals to us is is the joy that we need to have. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would meet with each one of us today. 
whatever we've come in to this building with today, whatever's weighing us down, whatever hurt we have, whatever disappointment, whatever selfish ambition, whatever misunderstood identity, whatever it is that we've walked in to this place today, would you help us to fix our eyes on an eternal anchor, on an eternal hope, and on an eternal joy? Help us today, God, have this perspective. And as we struggle and wrestle with these things that are weighing heavy on us today, your word is once again true that we are called to cast all of our cares upon you. You invite us to do that. And as we spent time in prayer earlier today, Lord, once again, right now, we do it again. We cast, we lay all these things here at your feet. Help us to have the eternal perspective and help our hearts to long for you. I pray, God, that we are known for our joy. That it's a joy not based in temporal things, but again, in eternity and who you are. And may that be visible and may that be contagious to those around us. That hope is proclaimed. Hope is made known. Jesus is made known and seen in our lives. Thank you for today. Thank you for your word. And thank you for this season. It's in your great, mighty name we pray and ask these things. Amen.